Welcome. Um, welcome to the National Center on Improving Literacy's second reading the room discussion. Today's discussion is entitled Instructional Coaching for Implementing and Sustaining Evidence-Based Literacy Practices. My name is Kristen King and I will get us started today. This event will be recorded and posted to the NCIL website. And please use the chat to introduce yourself. Once we get started with the panel discussion, we will be disabling the chat function and we encourage you to use the question and answer function to submit questions. We will be taking some of those questions at the end if time allows. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our executive director at the National Center on Improving Literacy. Dr. Hank Fein is the director of the National Center for Improving Literacy and is the professor in the Wheelock College of Education and Human Development at Boston University. He also directs the BU Teach Research Center at BU. His research is focused on the areas of early reading and early mathematics intervention for diverse learners in school settings. Dr. Fine Fien, most recent work is focused on scaling up evidence-based practices in school and to better understand the ecological factor of support or hinder the use of evidence. Hank, I'll let you take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, late good morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, it, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'd like to have the slides up. If we can put the... Give a moment. Excellent. Thank you very much. You go to go to the, the next slide. So we are the National Center for Improving Literacy. Uh, we have three primary partners, uh, Florida State University, FCRR's Florida Center for Reading Research, Boston University, University of Oregon, and RMC Research Corp. I'm also very uh, excited to announce that we have a new partnership with the University of Virginia that just joined for our next, this new five years of, of funding. The funding has come, comes through ESSA and through the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. However, because of our focus on students with disabilities, we uh, work very closely with uh, OSEP, Office of Special Education Programs. So I wanna thank you them for funding and support for our programming. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Very, very briefly, our primary mission is to scale evidence-based programs and practices related to literacy for all students with literacy-related disabilities, including dyslexia, to increase access to use of those evidence-based practices for screening, identification, and teaching those students with literacy-related disabilities. Our stakeholders are varied including parents, teachers, dist principals, districts, state departments, policymakers, uh, and families generally. We have five priorities. Uh, our first is to identify uh, and or develop low cost evidence-based assessments for screening identifying students with literacy related disabilities. Our second uh, priority is to identify evidence-based programs, practices, strategy, strategies to improve outcomes for students with literacy-related disabilities. Our third priority is provide information and free resources to families of students with literacy-related disabilities. Our fourth is to identify and develop professional development and technical assistance, primarily providing to state departments, districts, and teachers and schools. And our final priority is disseminating products um, on primarily through our, web, our website, improvingliteracy.org, 
and through such events as this. The Reading Room series is one of our dissemination efforts that is relatively new for us. For, so we'd love your feedback, and I think we'll send out an evaluation after the event. Uh, and please give us candid, uh, blunt uh, feedback on what you think and if there's areas that we should we should improve. Next slide. Maybe there is another other slide. So this is my opportunity to uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. Sarah Seiko. Uh, Sarah is uh, the deputy deputy director of National Center on Improving Literacy, or NSOL for for short. For the last five years, she's led the parent and family strand of the center, and in this new round of funding, she's going to be overseeing the parent and family strand the technical assistance strand and the dissemination strand. So she, she has her work cut out for her uh, in the next funding cycle. She's a senior research associate at RMC Research Corp in Arlington, Virginia. She was previously a literacy content specialist with the National Center on Instruction and a technical assistance provider with the National Reading Technical Assistance Center. She was an elementary reading coach and literacy specialist in Massachusetts public schools and as a certified K-12 reading specialist. I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, meeting her as much as I like working with her. So with that, I'll introduce Dr. Sarah Seiko. Thanks so much, Hank. Um, I wanted to provide you with a little background on our um, discussion today. So our Reading the Room series centers on discussions with researchers, practitioners, and community members on the science of reading, evidence-based literacy instruction, and related policies that affects students and teachers. The first event in the series, Shining a Glaring Light on Educational Inequities in Reading, occurred in February. We're pleased to share this second event with you, focused on instructional coaching for implementing and sustaining evidence-based literacy practices. Today, panelists will share their perspectives on the successes, challenges, and promises of using instructional coaching to implement and sustain evidence-based literacy instruction through the lens of implementation science. Before hearing from our panelists, we'll start by level setting on implementation science. So we have a basic shared understanding of it going into the discussion. So implementation science is the multidisciplinary study of methods and strategies to promote the use of research findings in practice. It aims to do this by providing frameworks to help organizations like schools create the conditions and activities that facilitate use of evidence-based practices, such as those in literacy. In 2005, the National Implementation Research Network, or NERN, synthesized implementation research findings across a range of fields. Based on these findings, NERN developed five active implementation frameworks to apply these ideas in real world settings. We'll be noting some of these frameworks and ideas during our discussion today. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Ms. Bonnie Short currently began her work as coordinator of the Alabama Reading Initiative in July of 2021. Her previous work as a primary grade teacher, reading coach, school principal, and a regional literacy leadership specialist greatly support and guide her current work. Bonnie received her undergraduate and graduate work from Auburn University, University of Alabama of Birmingham, and Troy of Phoenix City. She is a nationally certified teacher and has served in Jefferson County. Auburn City, and Lee County Schools. As she navigates each role, she clings to two ultimate goals. One, hang out with people who make you better, and two, leave things better than you found them. Dr. Laura Booker is the Executive Director of the Tennessee Education Research Alliance. She is also a Senior Lecturer in the Department of Leadership, Policy, and Organizations, or LPO, at Vanderbilt University, where she teaches program evaluation and research methods courses. Prior to joining the faculty in LPO, 
Laura worked for six years at the Tennessee Department of Education, where she led the research team and served as a broker of several research practice partnerships. Laura completed her PhD in education policy at Vanderbilt University as an Institute of Education Sciences Fellow, where her dissertation focused on measuring the quality of instructional practices. She has a BA from the University of Alabama and an MPP from Vanderbilt University. Dr. Angela Watkins has been in education for 26 years and currently serves as the Director of Elementary Curriculum, Instruction, and Student Support for Jefferson County Schools in Birmingham, Alabama, which includes supporting and building the multi-tiered systems of support. She served as a K-5 teacher, Assistant Principal, Principal, Director of Intervention and Student Support, which included working with the response to instruction process, She's truly passionate about providing students with a comprehensive approach to improving literacy outcomes. Welcome panelists. So let's jump in. Dr. Booker, you recently co-authored a research brief on instructional coaching. Can you please briefly explain the evidence base for instructional coaching as a means for improving teacher practice? Thank you, Sarah, um, and thank you to everyone who is here. I worked on instructional coaching research um, in the time that I spent at the Tennessee Department of Education and uh, co-authored this brief, uh, working uh, to review several um, uh, dozens of studies that have been written on instructional coaching. And the uh, one I'll highlight today is a 2018 meta-analysis of 60 causal research studies that finds that the difference in effectiveness between teachers who have instructional coaches and those without is equivalent to the difference between novice teachers and teachers with five to 10 years of experience. So the research base really supports instructional coaching as an intervention to support improving teacher practice and then improving student learning. And evidence suggests that thoughtfully designed instructional coaching programs um, are most likely to improve teacher practice and student outcomes, as well as those programs that are thought, because coaching is professional development, right? So coaching that also abides by the best practices of high quality professional development, having content focus, active learning, coherence, sustained duration, collective participation, those elements um, are also important to think about as part of your coaching program design. Um, and then you also have to think about who gets the coaching, right? Because oftentimes we don't have enough coaches to go around and we have to be strategic about um, the, co the coach assignment. And so novice teachers tend to be most frequently targeted for instructional coaching. Um, and research does find that those novice teachers who receive coaching are more likely to improve student learning and to stay teaching. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Booker. I want to emphasize a couple of points that you raised about um, the research. So you touched upon the idea of having a well-designed coaching program and implementation science, um, having a strong infrastructure or well-designed program is really important to implementation success. And in implementation science, they talk quite a bit about having a usable innovation, one that is teachable, learnable, doable, and easily assessed in practice. So Bonnie, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Alabama coaching framework, because we, we realize you have recently developed a coaching framework. Can you explain how the framework enables instructional coaching and literacy to be a usable innovation? Absolutely. And um, the Alabama coaching framework was formed um, out of the law that was um, created in 2019, um, which we refer to as the Alabama Literacy Act. And um, in implementing this act, we had to make sure 
that we looked at the philosophy of coaching and to make sure that we were aligned in what our philosophy of coaching looks like, not just in reading, but in other areas across our state. So um, through the help of um, our seven comprehensive center, um, we brought in various individuals who were um, stakeholders in different capacities to put together, explore different avenues of what coaching should look like, looking at the philosophy, looking at the function of the coaches, looking at the definitions. What do we say coaching is? What do we say these different parts are? And um, having those conversations mm -hmm. with um, different stakeholders in different core areas um, to put that information together. And so once we formed that information, then we brought additional people in um, to look at it from an outside view. Is what was put together, does it make sense? Is it clear? Is it something that anybody who picks it up can follow and understand what we believe about coaching in Alabama and um, that it can ensure consistency and fidelity across coaching. And so it was a real um, jumping point for the Alabama Literacy Act. And it's going to be really instrumental as we begin to implement the Alabama Numeracy Act this school year. Um, we've talked a lot about nomenclature and how important the words that we choose matter We've had the Alabama um, Reading Initiative here in Alabama for a while and coaching here in a while. We've seen it work really, really well. And then we saw shifts in what the philosophy was and then our data plummeted. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So this was a very important step for us to make sure that not only do we start right, but we stay right. I love that, start right and stay right. Uh, Dr. Booker, you mentioned high quality PD as being supported by the evidence base for instructional coaching. And in implementation science, that's one of the drivers. We call that a competency driver. So it focuses on selection, training, coaching, and use of a fidelity measure to develop the competence and skills of staff to use a practice effectively, like evidence-based literacy practices. So, Bonnie, just back to you for a minute. How do you hope the coaching framework is used locally to improve teachers' implementation of evidence-based literacy practices? Um, I think one just very simple example is when we're looking out, looking at the two ideas of pressure and support. Um, leadership, administration are the pressure. They are the ones who say, this is the way things are to be, and I'm going to hold you accountable for those things. Um, local reading specialists um, is what we call them in Alabama. They are support, and so making sure that we understand what the difference between those two words are, that we explore those words. Um, we talk a lot in what we call coaching communities, which is our professional learning that we do for our local reading specialist. And we talk a lot in um, our lunch and learn, which will still be a strong leader, strong reader meetings that we have for our administrators to make sure that um, the message is clear as to what each person's role is in the outcome for improved literacy. Great, well, Dr. Watkins, I'm really eager to hear from you uh, especially how you are using the coaching framework in Jefferson County to refine teachers' ability to implement evidence-based literacy practices. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I definitely would like to reiterate several of the things that um, Bonnie talked about because it started with us as building a relationship with our state department so that we were able to, in a safe space, get together, come together as a district, and then talk about what our data looks like and what that coaching support needed to look like based on our data. And so here in Jefferson County, um, we've started with just that same premise of building relationships within each one of our schools, with each one of our principals, because we know that every school is unique. 
Um, every school has its own culture. And so we have to make sure that that's in place first before we start into those pillars of effective coaching, which we follow um, through our Alabama coaching framework. And, and one of the big components of, of, of the pillar is getting into adult coaching and, and working with the adults in the building because we know if we are successful um, with that support, as Bonnie said, from, from our liter literacy reading coaches, then we will be able to reach our students. And so that's been our foundation first, stepping off into this framework, um, was to build that relationship and then work on how do adults learn and what is it that they, that they need to know. That's great. So that's a, the great segue into really asking you how coaches in Jefferson City facilitate improvements in teacher practice. So what have you learned about teachers' needs in your county? And then how do the coaches go about their work in facilitating that so learning? That's a great question because we have such a, a streamlined approach. I think um, one of the things that Bonnie mentioned is a clear process and make sure that everything um, flows and people know where to go to get that support. And so here in our district, we are able to work with our coaches at a local level. Even though we have the coaching communities, our specialists here and myself, we pull our coaches in and we work with uh, the, those coaches to talk about what are the needs of your building. Uh, what we found is that teachers, they have so much they need so much, but we as the coach have to go in and help them streamline that. What can we work with first? Where do we start first? You know, and so that takes a lot of time and planning, which is one of our big things is planning. And so our um, reading specialists are able to plan with grade levels, um, even do some one-on-one -on -one planning with teachers so that they know where their next steps need to be in that coaching framework to help support that teacher. So a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of time spent behind the scenes, you know, talking with the administrators, but just having a very good framework and knowing who to contact, um, what data we're looking at, that helps. Um, that helps our reading specialists really be able to do their jobs. Right. And um, I appreciate you mentioning the need to build relationships and also attend to adult learning principles. When we're thinking about this effort to implement evidence-based literacy practices, which can be very difficult for some teachers, novice or seasoned, um, to embrace the science of reading and, and these practices. So Dr. Booker, I want to turn back to you for a minute. What are some key considerations for designing an evidence-based coaching um, program based on the evidence? So uh, the meta-analysis um, that I mentioned earlier by Matt Kraft tends to find that smaller coaching programs were more effective. And I believe this comes down to the fact that smaller programs often have a more centralized locus of control and um, are can be more faithfully implemented um, and also a bit more um, thoughtful about alignment in terms of which uh, principles work, you know, and so as we think about scaling up programs, we have to think about building in flexibility. And we have to also think about like what, you know, is sort of a must have versus what is a nice to have um, in terms of our coaching program features. Um, but the brief um, on instructional coaching, that's part of the Ed Research for Recovery Research Synthesis briefs um, that I co-authored, goes through and talks about um, the best sort of principles from the research in terms of like, who should be a coach, um, what should coaches do, and what supports coaches need to be successful. And then also talks about um, what, you know, are we should be thinking about as we're thinking about uh, both scaling programs, but also um, the research supports making sure that as we design our programs, we're thinking about aligning them 
with our other systematic structures and schools. So, um, you know, do we already have PLCs? Do we already um, have um, a certain curriculum in place and uh, or other types of um, supports and uh, mentoring programs, right? And just making sure that our coaching program doesn't feel like one additional thing um, that we're asking folks to participate in or implement in their buildings, but that it feels um, attached to the other um, expectations that are being placed upon our um, leaders and teachers. Um, the, the last uh, piece I'll mention now is related to continuous improvement. We all know that when we first implement things, we learn a lot, right? And we have to continue kind of tracking data. I'm a, I, I teach these program evaluation classes and I'm a big fan of thinking about how we study the implementation, not just the it always the impact, right? Um, because that's that's the kind of analysis and data that tells us why something is or isn't working. Um, when I worked on a study of instructional coaching, um, thank goodness we were collecting data all along because we very quickly realized our coaches were not engaging in the key coaching practices. And it was because we had neglected to really include principles uh, and educate the principles um, about what it was we were asking the coaches to do. And that was, those were the people the coaches were reporting to, right? And so, but fortunately we were collecting data and doing surveys and we very quickly heard from our coaches that this was a challenge and were able to respond to that. So, um, you know, that is um, the, the other big coaching study I pick, I participated in also had some ongoing data collection embedded. So I just encourage, um, you know, everybody as you're, you know, no matter how big or small your coaching program is to think about what measures you already have. Maybe you already do surveys. Maybe you already have teacher evaluation or observation data. Um, just talking to your coaches, right, serves as a data point. And what can you do to, you know, making sure that you're revisiting the, the design principles you've put into place? Great, right, thank you. And some of the ideas that those research supported design principles that you just mentioned, um, like scale and coherence and continuous improvement, really map onto some of those other implementation drivers that is, is often spoken about in implementation science, which are leadership, um, the importance of leadership drivers and organizational drivers, which really um, oversee the, the systems level piece that has to be in place um, to make that coaching successful. So I'm wondering, um, Bonnie and Dr. Hawkins, when you, when you hear these ideas that Dr. Booker shared, you know, what resonates with you? And I know, um, Bonnie, in Alabama, you have the Alabama Reading Initiative support structure that you put in place. And it's intended to address the barriers um, to instructional coaching and literacy. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, how that structure goes about doing that. You know, one of the things that we kept hearing was um, leadership makes. And leadership isn't always administration. But if you don't have effective administration in the school, they become a barrier sometimes. And so you've got to make sure that your administrator, and when I say not effective uh, administration, I mean for whatever given situation, not an ineffective person, but a person who doesn't know how to affect the right direction that we're going in literacy. And um, we have a structure set up in Alabama where we have allocated $80,000 per local reading specialist and every school with a kindergarten, first, second, or third grade in it receives an allocation for a local reading specialist. So we're looking at about $60 million um, that are allocated simply to make sure that there are coaches in the buildings. But as um, Dr. Booker mentioned, when she talked about um, scalability can be a, a real challenge and being small, that's not small if we've got one in every place. So we've got to make sure we have other structures in place to support that. Um, we have regional specialists. And so um, by the Alabama Literacy Act, we have um, a gradual 
progression as to how much support each school gets based on their outcome data. So we have full support schools where they have a regional specialist primarily in one school um, and they work to support that local reading specialist. Then we have two other um, levels um, a limited support one and a limited support two. And you either get monthly or quarterly support at a minimum with the local reading specialist there. So you've got somebody who is receiving additional coaching training and is focused just on the literacy pieces that can go into that school and support. But on top of that, um, we have regional literacy leadership specialist, which was a position I was blessed to hold um, for a period of time. And it is, um, those individuals primarily work with central office and principals. And so they can work alongside those individuals to talk about the structures that are important in the school building to be able to make sure take place so that your local reading specialist can be effective. Um, when you talked about uh, Dr. Booker, that the um, communication sometimes breaks down. Um, we had a situation just in the past year. We do a um, memorandum of understanding with all of our local reading specialist and the superintendent, but who got left out of that? The principal and the curriculum director. So we've changed that. We've added those individuals in there so that they have the full understanding of the job description. They know the role of the local reading specialist. It is in our law what their job description is. So it holds a little more weight than if um, we were just to tell them. But um, everybody can be on the same page. And then when we have those um, professional learning opportunities with coaching communities with our local reading specialist, and strong leader, strong reader with our principals, we can talk about those specific job descriptions and what does it mean in your role? Um, how does this affect you? Also talking about that relationship piece um, that Angela mentioned, where the local reading specialist and the principal need to have a special relationship. They need to meet regularly. They need to share what each other is seeing in the building local reading specialist needs to be able to share those key points that they're working on. She needs to be able to show, show the coaching cycles that she's working on, whether those are full coaching cycles or mini coaching cycles. Um, we need to have those collaborative conversations in our state with all regional coaches um, to make sure we understand um, that we are looking for something that we call coaching heavy versus coaching light. Coaching is not running copies for a teacher. That may be a way to build a relationship and be winsome at the beginning, but we really need them to be in coaching cycles side by side. And that professional learning opportunity, um, like Dr. Booker mentioned, we are working right now with Regional 7 Comprehensive Center on a practice profile. And so we have coaching broken down to look at this is this is coaching, this is coaching that's better, this is really what we want to see. And I think um, right now we are kind of in that middle column right now in average where we've got some really good coaching that's going on, but what if they knew just a little bit more and can push further in one or two areas to start with? I say all the time, um, We've got to be better tomorrow than we are today. And so that's got to be our goal with each step is that we say, how can we be better, um, be one step better tomorrow? We also have streamlined um, our coaching philosophy and um, support in Alabama, our Alabama Math Science Technology Initiative and Alabama Reading Initiative um, have all been working um, recently over the last couple of years with Diane Sweeney and the work that she holds with coaching. And so we all share in the books that she's reading. We're also all working with Marzano's work, which is not coaching, but it is a, a um, structure um, and a philosophy to pull all of that learning together um, where we're speaking the same language and we're reducing um, the mental load on our our schools because we're talking the same language. That's great, Bonnie. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Watkins, in the spirit of continuous improvement, which Dr. Booker mentioned, 
um, a, a principle of implementation science is anticipating barriers and then um, addressing them early as possible so that you can uh, try to sustain those practices that you're putting in place. And so I'm wondering, Dr. Watkins, what barriers have you faced in Jefferson County with regard to instructional coaching and how are you working to overcome them? Yes, uh, very good point. Uh, there are always going to be barriers uh, in, in anything that you do, especially in, in uh, implementing anything new, but even trying to sustain things as we talked about the sustainability, uh, that's important. So a couple of the barriers that we've run into at the local level are uh, scheduling because it's very hard. We have 30 elementary schools um, just within our district. And so scheduling, trying to get out um, from, from the central office to get into the schools, to sit in those data meetings, to listen uh, to what the uh, coaches and the teachers are discussing, uh, that's, that's a challenge there. And, and a lot of times uh, that, that barrier there hinders that progress or that growth. Um, but we are constantly looking at ways to improve that. Um, it has become a lot better now that we have uh, utilized, as Dr. Booker said, utilizing all of the things that we already have in place. So we're utilizing the fact that we have our regional support specialists come in. And if we can't get to a school uh, for a particular data meeting, we know that they are there uh, to be able to help support and continue that conversation. Um, debriefing and giving feedback in a timely manner has always been um, a challenge for us. And, and so what we've started doing here at the local level is we've planned activities for our coaches. When they come and they meet with us, they do some role playing. They look at data. They look at um, how do you have this conversation with a teacher uh, that's struggling? How do you approach your administrator, your principal to talk about you know, what you've noticed and some things that systematically needs to change? So you know, although those are two huge barriers that we continue to face at the local level, we definitely, uh, through the Literacy Act and through our support from the State Department, we definitely have some, some things in place to help us get through those challenges. Right, thank you. Um, so we've talked about setting up and designing a, a system for instructional coaching and literacy. And now I want to sort of unpack what instructional coaching in literacy looks like in action. So Dr. Booker, what do effective coaches do based on the research? Yeah, so I mean, different models have been found to be effective, but there are some practices that have been uh, found kind of more consistently. Um, so planning discussions, observation and feedback, right, are ex essential coaching activities. We've had coaching cycles um, mentioned already um, on this webinar. Um, content specific coaching and reading and math tends to show greater effects on teaching and learning than coaching just on general coaching practices. Um, that aligns, again, with the research on high quality professional development being content specific. For, uh, frequency and duration. So having several coaching interactions during the school year, though the research tends to um, find that quality uh, is likely more important than quantity. Um, so as you were thinking about your program and thinking about the frequency with which, you know, uh, you want your coaches to interact with teachers and the number of teachers that they're going to be assigned to work with, um, those are um, some principles to keep, uh, that you can keep in mind. Re uh, research has also um, looked at uh, in-person coaching and virtual coaching and uh, found both to be effective. Diff uh, different studies have found that. Um, and uh, the other, you know, as we talk about it, implementation, I'll just mention that, um, you know, it time is a big uh, thing to consider, right? As well as the practices. Um, from our re uh, work in Tennessee, we have a survey that we do of instructional coaches, and I can drop that in the chat and it's open source. If other folks want to use this survey of their instructional coaches, you can. Um, the Tennessee Education Research Alliance partners with the State Department on this. Um, and uh, from that survey, we often found that coaches were spending their time sourcing 
resources and materials. Um, and they, when they, they report what their highest leverage activities are, it's things like observation and feedback. Um, but yet yeah, the, that's oftentimes they spend their time on materials and resources, which is why I think, you know, aligning with and focusing on how to reduce those barriers this can be helpful for ensuring coaches can focus on high leverage activities. That's great. That's an important finding. Thank you for sharing that with us. I have a follow-up question for you. What you, you talked about what effective coaches do, what types of supports do coaches need to be successful? So coaches can sometimes be lonely, right? Like you end up being the only one in your building doing what you do. Um, it can be a little isolating. And so the research finds that we have to give our coaches a way to be supported. Um, when I first started this work, a lot of times coaches were getting the same professional development that the teachers were getting and then expected to just re-deliver it to the teachers, but they need different supports. They need to be able to get together and talk about how to work with the adults they're, they are responsible for teaching. Um, and uh, so I had a doctoral student I, I supervised who who did a study around this in Ohio and they did a cross district coaching support network and the coaches really enjoyed the opportunity to even just hear what others were doing in other districts. So I just encourage, um, everyone to, uh, to think about not just, you know, how do you make sure your your coaches are supporting your teachers, but how are you supporting your coaches in their development and their needs, um, and in their networking? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question for us to sit with. Um, I want to wrap up with one question really for all three of our panelists to answer. Um, so maybe Bonnie, we'll start with you. Um, what advice would you give to others considering using instructional coaching as a means for improving teachers' implementation of evidence-based literacy practices? I think any time you're putting together a big structure, you've got to bring people together that are stakeholders and really explore because you've got to get buy-in. You've got to make sure that what you're going to do is going to head in the right direction. You may not have all the answers. And I think we've always got to be open to that possibility. I don't have to be the smartest person in the room. I just have to know who he is. And if I need some research, I'm going to Dr. Booker and I'm getting some research from her on the surveys that she's using. So I can't wait till she drops that in the chat. And then if I want to talk to a curriculum director about how do you get that many coaches together in the buy-in, Dr. Watkins is my girl. I noticed we have some friends from rail on here and they've been, they've got so many great free resources out there that we just snag all the time. And so, you know, taking advantage of the relationships and the opportunities that you have to gain from their knowledge and putting something together that's going to work for your individual situation. Um, Dr. Booker mentioned about when you're scaling up, sometimes you're having to be more flexible. And so you do have to have that open mind to understand that um, it may not be the narrow view that you have, but what are those core philosophies that are non-negotiable? And then what is preferred, or uh, I forget the term that you used, Dr. Uh, Booker, but it was a perfect explanation of, um, you know, I want this, but, you know, maybe I can do without it from everybody. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Dr. Watkins, what would be your advice? Um, I would have to say that making sure you're recruit, recruiting coaches that want to be continuous learners, because even though you are the coach, there are still things that, as, as Bonnie said, that you don't know at all. So you must continue to learn um, because once you build that powerful relationship with, with your colleague, you definitely want to be able to support them in every way. So if those principals and uh, district leaders uh, look for those coaches that want to continue learning because that's going to be the key uh, to success for the students in the long haul. Thank you. And Dr. Bucker. 
Re- really, I love the idea of learning from uh, each other. I, I remember in, in Tennessee, when I worked at the state, asking Alabama and Mississippi and uh, tr- reaching out and trying to talk to folks there, right? Because they've been there. Um, they've tested out different models. They've seen uh, what uh, what works and talking to those folks. Um, and then just as a researcher, I think the thing I do have to you know emphasize is, um, you know, looking toward your local research partners and seeing if you can find somebody to help partner with you on um, studying the implementation and impact in, you know, a thoughtful partnership type way um, in a way that feels like it's adding value and not just like additional things that we're asking folks to co- uh, data to collect, but that if, especially if we're getting into this for the long haul, that we're um, going to, put ourselves into a nice position to be able to study it in an ongoing way. Thank you. And um, I just have a final question for you, Dr. Watkins. We, I noticed in the Alabama Reading Initiative uh, support structure, families are recognized as an integral part of that support structure. So from you um, locally, how do you communicate with families about the purpose of instructional coaching or the role of the coach? So, you know, Sarah, that is a fantastic question because that's where our principals shine. Our principals are down there in the buildings every day and they connect with our families because they're letting them know, hey, we have the support you need. Come in, talk with us. Um, In our Literacy Act, we have what we call an at-home plan. Um, And so our principals connect directly with our parents, explaining to them, you know, what supports they have for them that they can use at home. But but they show that family-like atmosphere in that meeting when they're talking with those parents because we're giving those parents some hard information to take in. But when they leave out of that room, our administrators and our local reading specialists make sure they feel really good with next steps. And so that's where our administrators really, really shine with connecting with our families. We also have some really good resources, um, not only on the Alabama Department of Ed website, but if, if in our local schools, each school has some things listed or posted that parents can immediately uh, link on to to help support their students at home. So I think that's one of our shining stars for our administrators. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, Well, thank you to the three of you. We do have some time now to take some questions um, from our attendees. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jessica, who will pose some questions. Great, thank you, Sarah. So um, this first question is an open question to any of the panelists. um, And it's asking if you can speak a little bit more about the specific instructional coaching models that any of you use. So um, with the Alabama Reading Initiative, we've really been um, working toward Diane Sweeney's framework, and it's really about looking at um, those specific areas of the content where the need is and deciding, is this something that we're going to spend a lot of time on with this coach, or is this something that is going to be a brief push in and let them Um, continue and fly with that and um, you know using different strategies within that content to help support um, the direction that we're going with the coaching. We ask all of our local rating specialists to spend 60% of their time in a coaching cycle in classrooms working with teachers um, not just sitting in a room generating data or resources or support because we want to see the impact of the coaching and when you have a coach you have the opportunity to impact every child that teacher touches and every student that they have from here on out so we've got to make the most of our time um, and we've got to make sure that we're empowering our teachers and not just doing the work for them Um, we find that Um, The research supports that modeling should not be done as often, that it really the side by side aspect together is really where we're going to get the bang for our buck. So we spend more time in that side by side part 
working in um, tandem with the um, teacher instead of simply modeling for them and expecting them to turn it turn it around. We need them to have that vicarious uh, experience and um, then to practice that experience on and on and on, just like we expect our students to do with the new material that they're getting. Um, it can't just be a sit and get. Thank you, Bonnie. I put a math coaching model that we used in Tennessee in the chat um, that was based on a large research project. I thought the most unique thing to mention from that was the pre um, observation planning conference piece um, that I think you don't always uh, see, but that we found to be um, a, a useful way of engaging coaches and teachers. Thank you, Dr. Booker. I think we have I love that because you're really negotiating, um, you know, what you're going to do and put in action and making sure everybody understands why we've chosen those specific actions. And when you're doing that pre-planning piece and the reflection afterwards, then you have that opportunity for the real empowerment because you can check to make sure that they're understanding the direction that you're wanting them to go. Love that. Jessica, let's see if we can get one more question out. Okay, great. So um, as we face a national teaching shortage, what tips um, might the panelists have for recruiting coaches and maintaining fidelity to the coaching responsibilities when districts are already strapped for staff? The research supports that if you are coaching, um, your teachers, that you are more likely to keep them in the profession. And that's part of the problem we have right now is that we've had so many who have just been worn out through COVID and whatever else that they've been dealing with, and they're exiting the profession, or people are choosing not to be in the profession because they're hearing from colleagues how stressed out they are. And we've got to make sure that our coaches, our teachers, um, our administrators are supported in the work that they're doing and coaches help with that teacher support. Especially with our new teachers that, that we do have the opportunity to, to touch. Um, we have started the fact of going out to actually face-to-face -face walk into a classroom and say, hello, I'm Angela Watkins from the district. I, I work in curriculum and instruction. How can I help you today? Um, you know, uh, what's going on? You know, can, can I help with a small group? You know, putting ourselves in those buildings, in their shoes so that they understand. We know that there's a shortage out there, but just them knowing that we're out there, we're, we're helping to support and keep the ones that we have. And, you know, eventually this will get better. Just having that, that spirit of optimism, um, but definitely getting in the buildings and, and trying to meet those new people to make sure they don't leave us. <laughs> I think being thoughtful about um, whether or not you can use people who are not a full-time staff. Can you, can you allow for folks who are retired and who want to come back part-time or people who just want to work part-time, right? Um, but given um, the, you know, teacher shortages in particular areas, uh, this is where online coaching, right? Um, you know, I, uh, can potentially also be an option and just having to get a little bit creative, um, about um, the use of human capital resources when we're, we are facing so many challenges. Well, we're getting close to time here. So I do want to extend a thank you to BU Wheelock for hosting this event, our panelists for sharing their perspectives and experience, and our attendees for participating today. We hope you can join us for future Reading the Room events. You will receive a recording of today's event and it will also be posted on the NSOL website. A brief feedback form for the event will automatically launch in your web browser when you leave the webinar and we kindly ask for you to complete it then. To stay abreast of the latest NCIL news and information, please follow us on Facebook at Improving Literacy or on Twitter at NCI Literacy and sign up for our newsletter at improvingliteracy.org. 
Thank you again for joining us for the second Reading the Room event in our series and your interest in promoting evidence-based literacy practices. Um, we also, on our link to this event on our website, will have additional resources related to our topic today for you to explore, many of which were mentioned by our panelists. Have a great week. Thank you, everyone.